Welcome to What Are You Sporting About podcast, a podcast about business, employment, sports, and entertainment to help educate, support, and guide you to your next level. Here's your host, attorney Savania DeBarros. Hey guys, I'm Savannah Brown's Protector of Athletes, and guess what? We have wrapped up the first annual NIL Combine, live and virtual, to educate, support, and motivate athletes. Listen, whether you attended and did sessions or you did it, guess what? You can still be in the room. You can get all of this amazing information to help you retain more knowledge, sure up your knowledge, and take the proper steps so you can get from point A to point Z. Look, all of us want to be successful, right? We want to create sustainable wealth. We want to make sure that we are building legacies out here with our name and your likeness. So you can do that with the NIL Combine All Access Pass. All you got to do is go to bit.ly forward slash NIL Combine dash all access. Make sure you put that in all caps. Bit.ly forward slash all caps NIL Combine dash all access. Do not miss out on this opportunity. Our experts came, they dropped it, okay? They did their thing and the knowledge is there. All you have to do is take action. Go ahead, get your all access pass right now. Hey, hey, everybody. I am your host, Savannah DeBarros, the protector of athletes. What you guys just saw and listened to was a small clip of introducing the NIL Combine All Access Pass. So uh, let me just tell you a little bit about who I am and how this thing has come about, right? So for those who are familiar with me, you kind of know a little bit about my background. For those who don't, um, I am also an attorney and own the S. Elder Browse Law Firm and the host of this podcast, What Are You Sporting About? We recently launched the NIL Combine this past July. And my next guest was, was a speaker and a- expert for this NIL Combine event. So look, there were so many nuggets that were being dropped and I guarantee you, you will get something out of this pass. So if you have not yet, gotten access to the NIL Combine, you want to make sure you go to bit.ly forward slash NIL Combine dash all access, use it in all caps so that you can get access today. So without further ado, help me welcome Coach Dave to the podcast this morning. What's going on, Coach? How you doing? Doing great. It's a beautiful day out here in California. It's not quite sunny yet, but the sun is coming up and I'm excited <laughs> to be with here. So uh, with you and to just discuss all things about how to um, help people get better and and achieve what they want. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm just so excited that you were able to help me here. It's weird because when we first met each other virtually, I was in Portugal. Um, and, And from that initial connection, it's just crazy how fast I think our relationship has cultivated itself. Um, but it also feel like there's so much time has gone by, but in reality, it has not. <laughs> so for some reason, I thought I already had you on my podcast. And when you said, no, I haven't been on the podcast, I'm like, okay, we got to make sure we do that. Um, so I'm honored that you're here because you've, in a short period of time, you've impacted me greatly. And I think that's necessary um, to to have your voice on this platform to further impact other people who need a listening ear and the type of support that that you just I mean it just oozes from you so I want to dive in and just first ask you who is coach Dave you know what is it about you um in your position where people just seem to be able to open up to you and and really just latch on to the things that you that you have um to support them to their next level well um you know, I, you know, my mom would say it's because I've got these huge ears. And so people just are gravitated towards big ears and I'm a good listener. Now, I, you know, to be honest with you, um, as a young athlete, um, coming from a rough, uh, kind of a rough start, uh, you know, my dad wasn't around a whole lot and um, just dealing with a lot of issues that young boys go through. Uh, my coaches were more kind of my safe space. You know, I would go to my coach about issues I'd had at home and issues I was dealing with, with friends and social situations. And they became kind of my confidants. And luckily I had some good coaches that really poured into me. 
And so growing up as an athlete and kind of moving on into the first phase of my professional career, I just kind of had a really good role model of just being a good listener. And so that was just being available, being present for people led me into doing some ministry. Um, you know, I was a pastor for, for many years. I was a missionary for many years. I've been, uh, I've lived in a few different countries and so been exposed to lots of different tough situations for people. And I found that one of my greatest joys in life is being somebody that people could rely on and, and being somebody that people felt safe with. And so you want to make sure that when we're listening for folks that you honor, honor what's being shared um, and you don't interrupt and you don't um, you don't run to the conclusion. You know, guys, we tend to like to fix things right away. And so sometimes we got to sit with things and just listen and let people express themselves. So um, I don't know what makes me me. Hey, the Lord made me, you know, and I'm just, I just wake up every day and I just say yes to the Lord and whatever he has for me, I'm excited. Like even today, I'm, I'm not a very experienced podcast person, so I may totally mess this whole thing up, but I'm just going to be me and, uh, and just hopefully pass some joy on to some other people. So. No, that's good stuff. And neither am I. So <laughs> although I've been doing this, what, I think maybe two years now, but uh, at the end of the day, we're all still new with this. So that it's all good. You don't have to be an experienced podcaster or guest on a podcast uh, to come in and share. And I just, I absolutely love what you said um, about really wanting to create a safe space and not rushing to the conclusion of things because so often we can do that, which in my opinion, kind of removes the act of listening. Right. You, you know what I'm saying? Because in our mind, now we're thinking about the conclusion or, or how we think things are going to either turn out or why a person has made a certain decision or the, the decision that we think they will make based on what they're sharing. And so I think it's so important to um, check ourselves too when we have created that safe space for others to share with us, to be highly keen, highly aware of knowing whether you're drawing conclusions that are keeping you from or would keep you from really supporting that individual. So I, I really thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to ask you, though, this is a very important question that I ask a lot of people mm. is what does what are you sporting about mean to you? So, of course, that is the name of the podcast. Um, it's also the name of one of my books, um, you can see it in the background if you're watching this live. Um, and so I want to know, like, when you hear that question, what rings in your mind? You know, it's it's such a great question because to me, it it, it gets to what it like, what is your why? What's your what's your drive? You know, and not just a drive as an ambition or like a plan or a strategy, but what brings you joy? You know, when you hear the word sport, there's kind of a there's a game element, but there's also an aim element. Right. It's a game and an aim. And it's like, yeah, we're, we're going to have fun, but we're moving somewhere. And so what is your what is your joyful ambition uh, to me? That's that's how it resonated with me when I hear that question. It's like, what are you sporting about? What wakes you up in the morning? What drives you? What? refreshes you, but what also costs you some energy and time and effort? Um, what are you sacrificing for? And what do you hope to achieve with that sacrifice? And so, you know, for me, my sporting about has changed over, over the years, right? So, you know, I was, um, I started a children's organization in Kenya, um, was there for several years, and that was my sporting about, that was my purpose uh, for those six years until the Lord moved us back to the U.S. And then um, I was pastoring a church for a couple of years until, again, we picked up and had a different sport um, where we were working with some anti-trafficking efforts in the Philippines. And so that became my purpose for another six years and until that season was done. And I came back and, again, went into um, leading others in finding their mission uh, as a missions director. And I did that for a couple of years until this last year, um, when I stepped away from that and founded Shielded Mental Performance and realized that my new uh, mission field is in the area of high school and college athletics, 
um, standing with um, athletes that might be dealing with anything from feeling less than valued to anxiety and fear to um, connecting with people in a healthy way to um, figuring out um, who they are apart from being an athlete and, and being holistically healthy. But not only that, also achieving great performance, right? How do I really make the most of, um, of this opportunity I have in my sport that I've chosen? And so my sporting about, what, is, what am I sporting about? I wake up every day thinking, man, Lord, how can I, how can I get involved in, um, in, in another athlete's life? Or how can I help this coach? Or how can I help this team? And just use me. You know, every day I kind of just ask, ask God, can you use me in these conversations? Because I absolutely love athletics and I love helping young people. And so it was a great mesh for me. I, uh, I had a conversation last night with a 13 year old, uh, basketball player and her dad and, um, just absolutely overcome with pressure. And you can't, my heart just broke for her because she's a part of two, um, two basketball teams, a volleyball team. Her parents have her signed up in robotics classes and, and all, and she, you can just, she's just this overachiever and I'm sitting there and I, I, I originally intended to meet with the young athlete to meet with her and kind of encourage her. And all of my attention just went to the parents and said, what are you doing to this kid? You know, you, you know, you guys are, you guys need some help here and uh, let's talk as parents. And what are we doing to these kids that sometimes we, you know, anyways, I kind of went off track off your question, but it's my passion It's what I'm sporting about is how do you, how do you kind of help people figure things out? Um, the reality is every day we're a rookie, right? I've never experienced today before in my life. There's never been a day like today with you and I speaking with the plans that I, I've got going on today. And so I'm going to need some help getting through the day because I've never experienced today before. So why would we expect parents, athletes, coaches to know how to handle everything perfectly all the time? Because every day we're a rookie every day. We need some guidance. And uh, if I can be a guide to a few people, man, that makes me happy. Every day we're a rookie. That's that's a nugget right there. Um, and it just it just goes to show you that every day there may be newer things presented that we've never had to deal with before. In the same way, because I, I know you kind of went off, but I still love where you were going with this. And we are definitely going to dive into that um, because. You know, it, it makes me think about the parents in situations like this, the, the issue of what you are sporting about and helping these athletes to really figure out who they are. Um, I don't even think you can you can get to all the other stuff, like start dealing with all the other stuff until they realize who they are as people, because mm -hmm. losing a sense of identity and especially that early in life um, it breeds and builds anxiety and loss of resilience and decreased or diminished confidence, right? Because now it is, for lack of a better word um, or phrase, faking it till you make it. You're doing things for the benefit of other people who really want to see you succeed on this path. But is that really what I want for myself? And the, the answer may be no, but I put on this facade, right? And I show up and I'm good at this performance. It's essentially, I'm good at acting this out. Yeah. So I can, I find false confidence, right? I find false things to really help me to perform in this area. But when it's all said and done, is that really what I want for me? So you said that your focus kind of changed from the student to the parents what was their reaction? Um, did they really, were they able to take what you were communicating to them um, from a parental standpoint and long-term, you know, mental health or support right. for their child? Like, were they, were they able to really hear you on that? Well, you know, I, you know, I, I wasn't as confrontational or direct, you know, so you, you know, there, there is a, there is a way of leading people in the right path conversationally and letting them discover their own truth. So what we do is we couch it in the form of questions and answers. 
um, we we talk about, you know, so the, the 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 crux of the conversation was, hey, there's one evening and this girl has three different obligations. Which one should she choose? And I said, hey, well, let's talk about what your family values are. And you base those directional decisions based on your family values, not on the opportunities themselves. Because then what happens is, so for example, she had two, she had a volleyball practice, a one team basketball practice, but then this open gym opportunity where she would be exposed to a larger group of athletes. And so that was exciting, but she had two team commitments there, right? Um, she would, she was committed to these two teams to be a part of practice. So we talked about, Hey, what are your family values and so I gave a couple examples of like my family values. One, one of our family values as a Shields family is when, when one of us does something, we all are committed. And if we all can't commit to it, not necessarily physically being present, but, you know, in emotional support or mental support or whatever, then we need to, uh, we need to think about that. And so Another one of our family values is honesty, right? So if we can't be completely honest about something, then that's something that should raise a, raise a yellow flag to us. So for example, if I have to say no to an event to go to another event, but I have to make up a story, that's not being honest. That goes against our family values. So I was asking them, hey, you guys should probably think about what your family values are. And then as a family, decide which one of these three things that you should commit to. And so I was just kind of leading them down, kind of thinking of a different way of making decisions rather than, hey, what's going to get our kid the most exposure, the most uh, opportunity? Uh, because it's really, I told them, those opportunities are going to show up no matter what, because you're an amazing person. And, and you think this is the only opportunity, this is the only gateway, but the reality is you're 13 years old. <laughs> you've, got, you've got years of these opportunities. And if you miss one, you know what? Another one will be around the corner right now. You don't have to, you don't have to stress out so much about it. And I was really speaking to the dad, but aiming my, aiming my direction to, to the young daughter. Um, and I think that he was pretty receptive to it um, just because we had some preliminary conversations and I had, um, I had spoken to him privately before we met as a family and um, just kind of said, Hey, you know, my goal here isn't to, push your daughter. My goal is to, um, is to guide, you know, and that, and that's a, that's a big difference. Um, a lot of mental coaches or, or athletic coaches will be, if you, if you look at the image, they're either behind the athlete, pushing them up a hill or pulling the athlete. Um, but the reality is my role is to come alongside, right? And, and, and maybe even a step behind because the athlete should take the first step. And, and we kind of offer just a gentle, just to make sure that they don't slip as they take that step. But I used to tell my kids all the time, Hey, I will work hard if you work hard, but you got to work hard first. So I'm going to match your work ethic. If, if I show up to practice and you're goofing around, I'm not even driving you home from practice. You have to walk home. Uh, I, I, I'm not here to support your hangout time. I'm here to support what you're passionate about. If I show up to practice and you're really giving your best effort, I will take a second job to pay for your cleats and the tournaments. I'll do whatever I can to support your passion. But I'm not here just to force feed you athletics, you know. Man, this stuff is so good. Um, and a professional named Shanta Thomas, she said, that's good. And she recently stated, uh, she's watching this live. Uh, she loves this approach and this makes a phenomenal coach. You know, I, I really want to harp on the fact that if you guys have not, if you weren't at the NIL combine, you missed the show because coach Dave, I call him Pastor Dave, like he was out there hammering, going hard on it. Um, but it, when you were talking about like how you walk alongside the athlete, I just like visually seeing this diagram in my head, right. Where you have people pulling you in the front, others pushing you in the back, but the folks that you need to really support you along the side, they're guiding you um, almost like training wheels. And it takes me back to, to the nugget you dropped before. Like every day is a, is a different day. 
athletes are going to experience different things probably every day of their lives um, in various types of forms. But it also makes me think about um, what are the unnecessary pressures that parents and other people in our community are putting on student athletes to, to, I guess, operate from a a desperate mentality or Mm. a fearful mentality of possibly losing out on opportunities. Because I love what you said, like you're 13, you're a good person anyway, right? And generally people want to work with good people. Mm -hmm. And especially if you have an amazing work ethic on top of that, oh yeah, you are definitely going to get the opportunity. So what do you think it is? Is it is it fear from the parents that is now emulating onto the child? Is it a form of desperation? Look, or a, lot of, a lot of this is based in, in a lot of good, um, a good intention. There's very few malicious parents out there. They are, there are some, they have a talented uh, son or daughter and they think this is my way. I'm going to I'm going to roll the dice here and I'm going to put everything into their athletic future. And it's either going to get them a scholarship or it's going to get them a professional career. But we all know the statistics, right? I mean, that's, you know, that it takes a miracle to make it. It it really, you know, it takes some, it takes some fortune and it takes some hard work and it takes some natural talent. Um, Most of the time, parents just don't want to be bad parents. And they and they compare themselves with uh, their neighbor's son or daughter that's achieving a lot, and it becomes a parent race. And you see it a lot in youth sports. And they think if my son doesn't get the carries, or my daughter doesn't get the touches, or they don't get the playing time, I've somehow failed them because I haven't advocated for them. But what we're doing is we're crippling our kids by fighting their fights for them. I told um, this young girl last night, I said, your number one skill you can learn in youth sports is how to communicate for yourself with your coaches and your teammates. And how do you do that under pressure? And how do you do that when you're frustrated? Or how do you do that when you're happy? Like you're learning how to communicate with an adult. And that is a great thing. And and I, I say to all um, to all the time when parents want to talk to me about their kids, because I also coach, you know, I've been coaching for many years and so when parents want to knock on my door and send me a text or call and ask about something happening on the field, I said, Hey, have your son, give me a call. I'll gladly explain it to him. <laughs> I'm not going to, I don't need as a coach. I don't want to talk to a parent, to be honest with you. I want to talk to the athlete because that's why we're there. Um, parents sometimes in well-meaning parents get in front of their kids development by becoming their agent instead of their parent. And we really have to know our roles. Woo! Coach, when I coach my own son, he's very talented. My oldest son, very talented, natural athlete. He's playing soccer at the college level now. I never coached soccer, but um, he also played football, and I coach football. And um, we had a rule. I said, when I'm wearing my hat, I'm Coach Shields. When I take my hat off, I'm Pops. And we have different conversations based on whether or not I'm wearing a hat. Um, and so I gave him a visual trigger to know how to speak to me. And I also had a reminder too, of how I was to speak to him. And when I took my hat off, it was all, I'm a hundred percent in his corner, supporting him as a loving dad. When I had my hat on, I have to be the coach and I have to tell him the truth. Hey, you're not performing. You're not doing well, or, Hey, you know what? You're doing well, but let's let somebody else have an opportunity. Right. And so it was a lesson that, um, I learned from a mentor coach that I had who also I watched him coach his son and I asked him, how did he do that? And this is, this was a trick he passed on to me. So um, shout out to him. But, uh, but I think parents, well-meaning parents want to do well for their kids. They push their kids into every direction because they don't want to miss any opportunity. And then well-meaning athletes don't want to let their parents down. Kids love their parents and they're, th- they're thinking, Hey, my mom, she does everything for me. She really wants me to succeed. I don't really enjoy this sport, but I'm going to keep playing it because she loves watching me play. And they will kind of die inside sometimes just to make their parents happy. Now, sometimes the parents and the kids, they're on the same page. They both want the same thing and they're, and they're, and they're all for it. And I, Hey, that's great. Um, And it's hard in any arena 
for parents to let go and let their kids grow up. You have a normal student, non-athlete, and they're getting ready to graduate and go to college. How hard is it? That's why we get the empty nest syndrome, right? It's hard to let go. And in athletics, force us to let go in a different way um, where we have to become in the stands and kind of step back and let them perform maybe earlier or with some um, more emotion behind it then maybe we're ready for. So we have to check ourselves as parents. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. Um, and I like how you broke down like the parent-child relationship on different types of angles, because I, I, do, I do generally think that um, parents are very good intentioned and sometimes could be pushing their kids towards sports in general or a particular sport because of may be the outcome, the opportunity that may be attached to it as well, right? And then, of course, when you see a child's pure talent, like their raw talent, listen, mm -hmm. my high school track coach made me run hurdles because I was just playing around in practice one day. <laughs> how, many, how, many you, how many did you knock over? <laughs> oh, my God. Listen, but first, the very first time I ran over a hurdle, it was like just clean. And he was like, yep, you're doing the hurdles. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so let's put that in the context of like just pure talent for a child. You see your child do something like, oh my God. My kid was, which surprised me because I never shown him this, but yesterday he's sitting at the table and he started making music with the plate in the table, just hitting and having yeah. different sounds. I'm like, oh wow. But I know he's very creative. He loves music. He loves to sing. Um, but what parents would normally do is they go and put them in this one thing that speaks only to that raw talent, not mm -hmm. knowing whether this is exactly what the child wants to do. And unfortunately, sometimes, even though a child has raw talent, that may not be the thing that interests them, right? And right. so then we have this issue over time where, like you said, children are kind of suppressing or will suppress themselves on what they want to do to appease their parents. But then I, I ask myself, what does that do with or what is the impact on the resilience for the child? Because if they haven't learned how or wasn't given the opportunity, the space or the environment to vocalize how they feel about these things, um, not even just an opportunity, not to say that it's not a safe space at home, but mm -hmm. maybe they don't feel like there's an opportunity to truly communicate that this isn't really what I'm, I want, or I'm doing this for mom or dad, or even if I want to, mom and dad, you're taking the fun out of it because it's just so much pressure. Like, I want to have fun doing this. How is this impacting resilience for the student athlete? The, the, the number one, um, I think, I guess, um, formula or ingredient to building resilience as a young person getting up is going through and surviving something that's hard or difficult, right? And so not saying that you need to expose your kids to a war-torn area or, or starvation or anything like that. But I mean, the simple act of walking up a hill by yourself and being at the top of the hill and feeling satisfied with that metaphorically um, builds strength in you, right? And so having hard conversations making decisions and living with a consequence, um, raising your hand and, and being and saying, hey, this isn't me or you know what? I really am passionate about this. Let me express this. Like all of that builds our resilience. Now, granted, here's a little asterisk. To be great at anything, it takes discipline and hard work even when you don't feel like doing it. So you think about the great piano players I mean, and, and you'll hear those stories. Oh, I started playing piano when I was three. I don't know one three-year-old that raises their hand and says, I want to be a career pianist, you know, make me practice my scales every day, you know? So there is something to be said for repeated discipline over time in spite of your feeling. But hopefully in those moments of that journey, there would be moments of great joy and passion that come out. And that you notice that, right? And, and it's like um, our job as parents is to 
Um, notice the difference between a hobby, an activity, and a passion. And a hobby is what you do until something more fun comes along, right? I'll build model airplane until I'm bored with that. And then I'll build Legos or I'll go and draw a painting, you know, until something more fun comes along. An activity is what you do when all your friends do it. And if all your friends do it, do something else, then you do something else. And it's like, hey, let's all go down to the beach or, hey, let's sign up for this um, basketball team and play in this tournament together. Oh, well, we don't want to do that anymore. Now we're going to do volleyball. And so you do that. But a passion is what you find yourself doing alone when nobody's watching. When you have free time or free money or free energy and you find yourself doing that thing, my job as a dad is to find out what my son's are doing when nobody's watching and I need to find fund and fuel that and these other things, I'm going to give them freedom to pursue on their own because the way you find your passion is by getting involved in hobbies and by doing different activities and testing different things. But the level of commitment is so much different, right? And the level of, and the level of investment, what happens right now is parents are funding and fueling hobbies and activities and hoping that, hey, if I play the numbers game and they go in every direction, we're going to find one passion. Not knowing that whenever you do a hobby or an activity, it costs you energy and it costs you um, effort and emotional strength. And so by the time you do find your, your passion, you don't have the strength to do the repeated discipline activities to become great at that. You've wasted all of your, your, your you've, you've made commitments to six or seven different things and you just have no break in your schedule. And you know how it is. Uh, you and I both know the importance of rest, even in a professional's career. And so if you don't have time to rest and recuperate and have time to yourself, you're going to gradually get weaker at what you want to be great at. Oh, all of that was good. Hobby, activity, passion. And I think we as even as adults, we need to figure out, like, what are we really doing? You know, because um, sometimes I think we might be putting more stress and aggravation on ourselves than what we need to. And, and some people don't even recognize that they're really involved in a hobby, not really a passion driven thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that kind of goes back to identity, too. Like sometimes and people get. And can I can I jump in yeah, there? Real yeah, quick? Go ahead. It is completely OK to be in a hobby. Right. You know, you just have to right size your expectations of what that means. Exactly. <laughs> and that and that's where the problem is. Like if you yeah. don't know that you're involved in a hobby, but you're thinking it's really a passion, but it's it's short lived. It's because other people are probably, you know, interested in this thing. And you're saying, oh, well, this is my passion. You got to You need to figure out like who you are. Right. Mm -hmm. Because what drew you to this? Um and, yeah. and I, I can okay. go off on a tangent. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> As a teenager, it's okay to not know what your passion is. How many yeah. college um, students change their major three or four That's times true. in three or four years? That's like, very true. It's a part of discovery. It's a part of growing up. And be okay. Be okay to know that that's where you are. Yeah. You know, I, I think maybe we need more people to say that that's okay. That's no, I mean, that's, like you said, that self-discovery um, as you continue to grow. And I always share with people, even though I have, I know what my purpose is. I've, I feel like I've always known what my purpose is, but it has shifted and changed and, mm -hmm. you know, molded over time um, yeah. and taken on different forms. Because I feel as humans, um, when you do begin to accomplish things, you start to see and if you're working and you found that passion, you found that purpose, you'll start seeing it guide you along different paths and different ways. And it could completely change, right? It depends yeah. on the person because as you stated, we we are rookies every day, but in our lives, you know, there are certain parts um, that we grow into that completely changes. We change as, as a person mm -hmm. all the time. And so that may also change along with you. Um, I do want to ask you before we wrap up, though, especially for wrap up. We're just getting started. I know we're just we're getting started. Listen, okay. Look, we are not going to aggravate these people all day, Coach Dave, because yeah. <laughs> we I know we can stay on the phone all day. But um, for your your college athletes right now, you're in football season. Mm -hmm. um, 
what are some of the conversations or let's just say it like this what are what are some tips or nuggets of advice you're giving to your student athletes to help them not only perform physically but to to really show up with that mental fortitude yeah well you know i'm partnered with this um with this uh with wellness university and wellness university is an app that's that that student athletes can download and when you do it as a team what's great about this is it, it makes you take a survey and then it puts resources in your hand so for example based on your emotional survey um, it'll give you resources to articles and videos based on the result of your survey. So for example, if the result of the survey shows, Hey, you know what? Sleep is a really big concern to you. You have access to articles and resources that will help you adjust your sleep pattern. Uh, if, if, if it shows that worry or anxiety is, is, is of a concern to you, it has access right in your hand. Um, so that the student athlete can actually have more control over the help, the kind of help that they're getting. They don't have to walk into a big scary building and raise their hand and talk to a psychologist. They can, they can have access, immediate access. And um, so we're doing that with the high school team that I'm coaching right now. And it's been a pretty phenomenal um, study on how ready these athletes are to talk about how they're feeling. Um, and they just kind of needed an invitation to do so. I think that um, the, if I were to give one message to athletes out there everywhere is it's okay to talk about this stuff. It's okay to say that you're not a hundred percent certain and a hundred and that you don't have, you know, I'm tough and I can figure this out and I just have to bear down and, and, you know, this is just part of life. And, um, you know, there are people in the world that want to listen and want to be a safe place for you. And I think that, even non-athletes, I would say everybody needs a safe person to go to and just be themselves. Um, somebody who's a little bit removed from your day-to-day -day experience, that creates that safety of distance. But somebody who knows you well enough that you don't have to re-explain who you are every time you meet them. Um, so it's somebody that's like at a cousin distance, if that makes sense. Somebody who's you see every now and again, but you don't see them every day. So you're not embarrassed to see them once you start talking about the things you're thinking about and some struggles you might be having. Probably a not a safe person is is um, is somebody who is a teammate or a coach. In the, and as much as you'd want them to be, they have an investment in who you are. And, the, you know, if they it, it, it kind of you kind of become more guarded by what you share because you don't want to appear to be weak or a burden or, you know, uncertain in any way. So find a coach of a different sport, find uh, somebody who's familiar with sports, find somebody who is in the counseling field that would say, you know, like a student counselor on campus or, or just somebody who has that gift, you know, maybe it's a youth pastor, maybe it's a, a, a friend of your family that, you know, that you could trust and you can say, look, you know what, I really want to do well in this sport. In order for me to do well and to be emotionally healthy, I need to talk about stuff from time to time. Would you be available? Could you fill this part of my, one of the things I do with my athletes is I help them learn how to build their support team. And we have job descriptions and, and I tell them, you need to interview people for these jobs. They, they don't just qualify because they're your buddy. They qualify because they're gifted and they've accepted the responsibility. They're going to be this emotional support for you, this inspirational support for you, you know, all of these kinds of roles. And so build your support team, but make room for that safe person that you can, you can just un un unload yourself to. I'm glad that you mentioned that because you, you talked about that during the NIL combine. And I think it's important for people to, to recognize that quality relationships are necessary in your life. Right. Yes. Um, and when you are interviewing these people, I, I don't think I don't think we've ever been taught that it's okay to interview, like to really see if a certain person is who and what you think they are and can really support you um, at whatever juncture you are in your life. Um, yeah. You know, and it's it's something I wrote about in the What Are You Sporting About book as well. Like we have to have, like if I'm talking about mentors, especially we need quality mentors 
no matter what they're going to mentor you on, you have a mentor for any and everything, right? But they need to yep. be of quality. Um, and so sometimes that's also looking at people who may be the closest to us, not looking into the stars for the person that was on TV and doing this and doing that. You know, sometimes our the best quality people are those who are closest to us. And so, you know, kind of taking um, note of those people, get out, you know, a sheet of paper, write a list down of who you think can support you in a particular area of your life. And then invite them to a call, invite them to really see if they will be open to this. Yeah. And I, I love how you said that these students um, are now have been given the opportunity to talk about needing the mental health support. Um, and I love that because I, I thought that they would be more closed off from it. But I'm seeing that this generation is like, we're well, back. <laughs> when you're talking about high school football players, you're gonna get you're gonna get a a, a range, right? You are gonna get the cool kids, and the cool kids used to dominate what would be termed as the uncool kids, right? And and so what I'm seeing is a shift is now now the the majority are the kids willing to give things like this a try, willing to open up and be vulnerable, willing to talk about things that used to you you know cool guys don't talk about that stuff. Now the minority is the cool kids in the back kind of joking around and trying to like be, but they're, that group is getting smaller. And so, and so uh, I mean, my heart is still for them and I still work hard to reach those kids in the corner. Um, but I'm really pleased at what's happening with the majority in the room, which is um, when I took a, a survey the other day, 75% um, of our team, when the survey showed me that sleep was a huge concern uh, for most of our kids. And after our discussion on sleep and some suggestions on adjusting their sleep patterns, 75% of our team have adjusted the way that they go to sleep based on our conversations. So that tells me that this generation is willing not just to talk about things, but to try new things um, for their own benefit, which is encouraging. And so they, 75% um, of them are now turning their phone off a half hour before going to bed. If you can imagine that now they could all be lying to me and I could be the most gullible coach in the world. But I believe that at least a, a huge part of our team is trying something new to help them be more emotionally healthy the next day. Yeah, I love that. I have a, a sleep um, notification on my phone. It literally goes gray. Okay. And it, would tell, it would tell me how much my, you know, my activity is. Um, even during, you know, during those parts, because the whole premise is to, you know, create a higher level of health, mm -hmm. be able to get better sleep, um, turn those notifications off the ringer and all that stuff. Uh, so yeah, it literally, you can set it on your phone. Most phones have this app built in, built in, um, go in and put in your sleep mode. What time do you need to go to bed? And it will literally turn all that stuff off. Coach Dave, this has been such an amazing time to connect and talk with you um, about how you are impacting student athletes and also even, you know, their parents and their community. I love the work that you're doing. And I am super excited just to continue down this path of collectively supporting athletes in their village, because I know it's something that's necessary. Um, I mean, these are amazing individuals and it takes people like you and I um, who make up the village to continue being able to impart good things and positive things and, you know, to really, and, and have the courage to call them out too, um, just to be better humans, to go out into this world and do good things. So I, yeah. I definitely appreciate you. Well, thanks so much. And if any of your listeners uh, want to get in touch with me, you can get in touch with me on shieldedmentalperformance.com. Uh, you can give me a shout out there and um, and set up an appointment. And I do do it via Zoom all the time. So I've got I've got athletes um, all over and uh, love to connect with anybody in the in the arena and uh, see how we can help each other. And Coach Dave is also on Twitter at Shielded Mental Performance. And you can find him on LinkedIn at David Shields. So if you have not created a LinkedIn account, you're missing out. Make sure you go to LinkedIn, create your account, connect with Coach Dave. He's on there at David Shields. Um, it's You can find him very easily. Okay, guys. Look, as I've always stated, 
I'm always trying to find people who can encourage, motivate, and really support you to your next level, right? That's what it takes. That's what it's all about. So if you have not subscribed to this podcast yet, make sure you go to your favorite podcast platform. Click the button to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You'll get alerts when I am live with an episode, okay? So make sure you go subscribe to What Are You Sporting About so you never miss anything. And until next time, guys, I will check you later. Ciao. For joining us this week on What Are You Sporting About podcast. Make sure to visit our website, prosportlawyer.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite platform is so you'll never miss a show. And while you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes or iHeartRadio. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you like the show, you might want to check out our book, What Are You Sporting About? Attorney Savania DeBarros is available for private consulting at sldebarros.com. And remember, we're here to educate, support, and guide you in your journey to success because we're all sporting about something.